you I can find the book. And says I, I'm going to be able to. You know you're live, right? No, I know I'm live. I'm okay. Live. <laughs> but maybe nobody's watching it. I've been live streaming every week. Mr. Graber, did you take the fourth out? Mr. Graber? Graber. Somebody said I played that last week, but that's okay because it goes right along. Hey, good morning. It goes right along with what I'm going to be talking about today. And it's good to see all of you here. I want to welcome also our international audience online, those who are watching it live and those who will be seeing it later. This is July the 8th. It's a beautiful morning outside. It's also good to have our first time visitor here, Mr. Graber. Did I say it right? Good to have you, sir. With a good German name like that, you can expect me to mispronounce it. We like people to mispronounce my name. If you got the little email from us uh, last night or early this morning, you know that what I'm going to be talking about is to take a glimpse at the greatness of God, and it's only a glimpse. Have you ever laid awake at night thinking about the fact that God not only has eternal life forward, but he has eternal life into the past. Hey, come in. Not only forward, but into the past. And that's a very hard thing for us to comprehend. It's an extremely hard thing to grasp that God has always existed. But according to John 1, 3, he made everything that exists. There's nothing made that wasn't made by him. 
And so here's the thing. If God has created everything, then who, who made God? And every little kid wants to know that. Now, when I was a child, I had it all figured out. Jesus made everything that is. I was scripturally accurate, theologically sound on that, just as a little kid. And I said, now, God made Jesus. Somebody said, well, who made God? Well, I didn't know. But I had it all figured out. The fact of the matter is, the Bible says in Micah 5, 2, that, that even Jesus, his goings forth are from everlasting. Not from Bethlehem, but from everlasting. Christ, just like God the Father, has always existed. Now you say, but that's not logical. Well, let me tell you something that's even more illogical. And that's to believe that God created himself. You know, in Psalm 100, it says, It is God who has made us, and not we ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. God created us. Well, who made God? Logically, scientifically, God could not have had a beginning because had he had a beginning, so it doesn't make sense. Either way, it doesn't make sense to the finite human mind. But God has always existed because if he was created, then let me ask you, who did create God? Well, whoever created God would be God, some other God. That begs the question because now we've got to ask, well, who made him? Who made that guy? I shouldn't say that guy, pardon me, that other being who made our God. So ultimately, let's say that God was made by another God who was made by another God who was made by it. All the way back, a million gods, well, who made the first one? Ultimately, you get back to an eternal past, which makes no sense to our human minds. How could anybody have an eternal past? So let me ask you this question. And you'll get an A on this one if you're still in class, by the way. What was God doing 100 million, billion, trillion years ago yesterday? 100 billion, trillion years ago. He existed. What was he doing? You know, there is evidence, or I shouldn't say evidence, there is intimation in the Bible that God may have made other universes before this one. This universe is no more than 13.7 billion years. Some people say 6,000 years old. But the point is, this universe is not that old. Now, a billion's a lot, but compared to eternity, what's a billion? 13 billion? That's nothing. So is it possible that since God is a creator, that's his MO, is it possible that this is not the first universe God ever made? Well, what would give you that intimation? Because in Revelation 21, John said there's a new heavens coming. We call that the heavens. Scientists call it the heavens. The Bible calls it the heavens. The heavens. All the galaxies. They used to say, scientists said, we now estimate there are 90 to 100 billion galaxies. The average is the size of the Milky Way. Some are much bigger, some are smaller. But the average is about 100 billion stars, which we have in our Milky Way. And, and I mean, when I wrote the, the Prove All Things Systematic Theology course, they were saying then around 100 billion galaxies. Well, about last year, they updated, maybe two years ago, they, scientists have now updated that. They were wrong. They said now they know that there are at least two trillion galaxies. How big is that universe? And yet John says a new heavens is coming. Now, without the Bible, if you just believe the second law of Newton's, second law of thermodynamics, which talks about entropy, that everything's running down, eventually... The finite amount of helium and hydrogen and our sun and every other star will burn itself out and will simply be exhausted. And so every star in every galaxy will eventually burn up like a candle and there'll be nothing but darkness. Nothing. So there has to be a new heavens eventually or else we're going to spend eternity in the dark. We'll watch, be watching television by candlelight because there won't be any light. So... Yeah, God's going to create a new heavens. Now, here's my question. Since this heavens, the heavens we now have, is going to burn itself out, is this the first one? He, what was he doing 100 trillion years ago? Maybe he was making other galaxies and other universes, and they burned out. He made another one. They burned out. What do you do when the light bulb goes out? I keep coming in here finding light bulbs gone out. A new one went out this morning. Oh, a new one went out this morning. Okay. So I keep finding light bulbs going out. So we've got some light bulbs over there. We have to continually replenish them because we don't if we had not been putting in light bulbs here eventually we'd be sitting in the dark because they do burn out the universe is the same way 
So it's very possible that if God has existed from all eternity, he didn't wait until 13 billion is out. They call it mega universe. It's very possible he's been making them all along anyway. Well, how many universes has he made? Well, considering the fact that he has infinite age into the past, our universe might be the most infinite, umpteenth universe that God has made. That makes no sense at all, does it? It makes no sense. Do you understand the greatness of this God we serve? He's not just uh, the picture we see in Michelangelo's famous painting where God is creating Adam by touching him with his finger. God is much more. He is an eternal, infinite, almighty, omnipotent, and omniscient being with whom we have to do. And he created your very life. And the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that, that your very breath is in God's hands. God holds your breath. He gives you every breath of air you breathe. So your heart, your life, your very existence is in God's hands. One thing about God, he loves his creation. You read Genesis, everything he makes is, behold, it's good. That's good, that's good. Joan Rivers, the famous comedian, said the way the true story is, God made everything and said it was good. Then he made man, and he looked at man, and he says, I can do better than that. He made a woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's John Rivers' apocryphal account of creation. So, all these ladies are in trouble. <laughs> so, that you know, God made everything said was good, and since He loves His creation, He loves you, and He knows you've done bad things, and He knows you've made mistakes, and you, He knows you've had faults and weaknesses of flesh and weaknesses of mind and wisdom and everything else he knows that and yet God says he still loves us why he made us you know the Bible likens God to a father and it likens us to children and when you look at parents and children their parents that the kids can do all kinds of things and the parents still love them now I'm not a parent I've never raised kids I had a nephew that I helped raise so I don't understand how you parents feel because I've never raised children. I helped raise him a little bit. But I can sort of understand it, but not perfectly because I've never raised children. I don't know how you parents feel about your kids. I told you the story about this lady whose son was a serial killer, and they interviewed this lady and said, how do you feel the, the fact that your son has confessed? He's on death row. Your son has confessed that he's a serial killer. How do you feel about that? She said, I love him. They looked at her and it said, but how can you love him? He's killed all these innocent people. And she said, he's my son. Isn't that amazing? And when you read the book of Isaiah, which we're going to take a look at today, no matter what Israel did, God said, I love you. And the whole purpose for writing all these chapters, 66 chapters, one of the longest books of the Bible, about what they've done wrong and how they should repent, how he wants to bless them, the whole reason is for that is because God loved Israel no matter what they did, like a loving father. The disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. He said, well, here's how you pray. Use this method. Follow this formula. Our Father, who's in heaven. Not just Yahweh. A lot of people want to call God by some Hebrew name. The JWs want to call him Jehovah. Not that that's necessarily in itself wrong, but the way we should address God is not by some personal name any more than I ever called my dad by his personal name. If I had done it, it knocked me across the football field. I never called him by his first name. I called him Daddy. That's how we speak in the South, for those of you in other parts of the United States. We call him Daddy. If you got your Bibles this morning, let's go to Isaiah 40. I'm going to do something today that in all the 30 years of ministry that I've had, I've never done before. I imagine other ministers and other churches, certainly over the centuries, have done this many times, but I've never done it. We're going to take a look. At, the, at part two, as scholars call it, of Isaiah. And we're going to look at the greatness of God. Now, this is not going to be my opinion or my interpretation. This is simply going to be what God says to us about who he is. God is introducing himself to us. Now, some liberal scholars who don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible, maybe some of you have run across this nonsense. They say there were two people that wrote Isaiah. Isaiah wrote chapters 1 through 39, but some mysterious person, we don't know who, wrote chapters 40 through 40 through 66, the second part. In fact, 
in my reference Bible, some of you have a reference Bible, on the first page of Isaiah, chapter 1, right above chapter 1, it says, Part 1, looking toward the captivities, chapters 1 through 39. Now, in Isaiah uh, 40, here's what it says. Above that, in my reference Bible, Part 2, looking beyond the captivities, chapters 40 through 66. And there are scholars who say, Isaiah didn't write the whole book. Why? Well, because the writing style is different. And I've gone through this over and over with all of you. If you write a letter to your boss, and then you write a letter to your wife, will the writing style be exactly the same? Especially if you're writing her a very uh, affectionate letter, will it be the same as you wrote to your boss or to one of your employees? Maybe you're a supervisor. Are you a supervisor, Eric? Foreman or something? He's a chef. So he tells people how to cook. But, but when you write a letter to your employees, it's not going to be the same style as that you write to your wife. Or if you write a letter to your mom on Mother's Day, that, is that going to be the same as, as when you wrote a letter to one of your employees and fired him? <laughs> the style is going to be different. Same person. So because the style is different, liberal so-called scholars say Isaiah didn't write the whole thing. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn to these New Testament scriptures, but if you're taking notes, you may want to pay attention to this. Jesus said that Isaiah wrote both parts, parts one and two of the book. You'll see that in John 12, verse 38, where he said, didn't Isaiah write to you? And then he quotes out part two, verses 40 and 41. We'll see that, that, he, that actually uh, he quotes two different places. He quotes from part one and part two of Isaiah. And Jesus said, that's John 12, 38 and 40 through 41, Jesus said, said that Isaiah wrote both parts, and I'm going to take his word for it. Now, I want to, so Isaiah wrote this, but the style is different. So just in case you say, well, I don't know that Isaiah wrote that because some liberal scholars, uh, they, they're, they're scholars because they've written a book, somebody read it. That makes them a scholar. But they, they don't believe what Jesus said. That's their problem. Now, I'm going to go to Isaiah 40. Like I said, I've never done this before in all the 30 years of ministry that I've had. I've never actually done a study of verses of chapters 40 through 66. The reason the style is different, the first 39 chapters deals with what's happening in Judah. It talks about the sins of the people and how the people are going to be punished and so on and so on. How they're going to go into captivity. Now, of course, Isaiah, he'll talk about all the bad things in the very next chapter. talks about the kingdom age, the millennial age, like chapter 2. Then chapter 3 goes back into the bad things. You get to chapter 11, talks about the kingdom age. Then he goes back into all the bad things that are happening and how they're going to be punished. You get to chapter 35, it talks about the kingdom age, the millennial age. Again, back and forth, back and forth. And that's the first 39 chapters. Then you come to chapter 40, and it's, the style is different because it's writing about a different topic. Look at verse 8. The grass withers... The flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that brings good tidings, good tidings means good news, translated as gospel in our New Testament, gets you up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that brings good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. <clears throat> behold your God. That's what it says. Verse 10, behold the Lord God, and the word God in all capital letters, there's the Hebrew word YHWH, which means the eternal. I'm going to read it that way. Behold the Lord eternal will come with strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. When Jesus returns, he's bringing his reward. That's Luke chapter 19. That's Revelation 22, verse 12. And he's got his work cut out for him when he comes, because when he comes back, the whole world is in a mess during the Great Tribulation. And so his work is cut out for him. He's got a lot of work to do. The Great Tribulation which has killed possibly up to one-fourth of mankind. The great and terrible day of the Lord, which follows that, kills up to one-third of mankind, so the world's in a horrible devastation due to World War III. Verse 12, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out or measured heaven with the span? This is a span from your thumb to your little finger. That's a span, about eight to nine inches. So God looked at the sky and he said, Hmm, we're going to make it uh, so big. You can't do that. But God did. 
He measured out heaven with the span. He comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. Took a, it says he weighed the mountains and scales and the hills and the balance. So he took the scales and he figured out, put some dust on, figured out how, how much the earth would weigh. This is how great our God is. Verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, or as we would say, a drop in the bucket. That's where that expression comes from. That's like a drop in the bucket. Now, if you've got a great big bucket and you have one drop in it, that drop is so insignificant, you can't even drink it. It's too small. All the nations are like one drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance, which means they don't weigh anything. Behold, he takes up the isles. The margin says the coast, meaning the continents, as a very little thing. All nations before him are as nothing, and they're counted to him less than nothing, and vanity, and in Hebrew, vanity means emptiness, futility, or worthlessness. To whom then will you liken God, this infinite being who's always existed? What likeness will you compare to him? You say, why are you talking about this? You ever had any problems in your life where they were insurmountable? Where you were facing an impossible situation? Where you needed direction and you didn't know which way to go? Somebody said, why don't you pray? I ain't religious. <laughs> or I prayed and nothing happened. You who you're talking to? You're talking to this infinite God who loves you so much. Jesus said he even knows how many hair, the numbers of hair you have on your head. He even knows that. Why? Who cares? How, how many of you have ever stood there looking in the mirror and said, one Two, three, three. Did I count that one I know some of us don't have much to count. <laughs> a little easier for some than others. A little easier for some than, than others. But however many there are, he knows them. He knows how many. But, you know, why would God care? Have you ever seen a, a mother with a newborn baby? And what does she do? She counts the fingers. She counts. You do that, didn't you? You, you, you count the fingers, you count the toes, make sure they're all there. And if that baby even has the smallest birthmark, that mama knows about it. Who cares? I mean, what difference does it make? Because that mother loves that child so much, she knows everything about that little baby. Everything. In fact, later on, when that baby cries, she knows whether the baby's in pain or whether the baby's hungry. She can tell from the way the baby cries. All I hear is a baby crying. But that mother loves that little baby because it's hers. And God looks at you and he says, I love you because you're mine. And I created you and I made you. I even know how many hairs you have on your head. Why? Because he loves you that much that he pays that much attention. If he knows that, what about the problems you're going through? And the struggles and the challenges that you're going through? He knows about them. Now, before you say, well, if he knows about it, why don't you do something about it? I mean, dear man, I'm going through all this mess. How come he doesn't straighten out? I've said that before. I was trying to get somebody healed many years ago. And I prayed and prayed, and I anointed them. I probably used a whole bottle of anointing oil, and nothing happened. I'm saying, God, what is this? And then I finally learned it wasn't a physical problem for God to heal. It was all up here. You see, you know, if you go to the doctor, you got to tell him what the pain is, or otherwise he's going to mistreat it. He's going to treat the wrong thing. I was trying to get God to heal something where there's no healing needed. The healing needed to be in the mind, and we weren't addressing the problem. So don't get discouraged and say God's not doing anything. It may be that you're not approaching it correctly. There are times when you've had prayers answered just like that, and there are other times when you've had to wait and wait and wait, and it just never happened. This infinite God loves you, and he cares about you. I, uh, we had a ministerial, not a ministerial luncheon, we had a church uh, cookout many years ago. And I invited a minister from up in Newton to come. I think he preached and we had a dinner afterwards. I was pastoring a church in Kannapolis way back, this is back in the 80s. And I was saying, let me tell you a great testimony. And I talked about this fellow that had terminal cancer. He was 18 years old. And I explained how that I had preached a sermon on faith and how the believer would lay hands on the sick. You've heard me tell this testimony in class. And this uh, couple, this married couple, it was their nephew. And uh, so after service, I told them, go down there and lay hands on him, raise him up out of that deathbed. They gave him just a few weeks to live. He couldn't even turn over in bed. 
They went down there and followed my instruction, laid hands on him, confessed the boy's healing over him. Immediately he received strength and got out of bed and stood up. Terminal cancer. He had three weeks, I think, to live. He had innumerable cancerous, malignant uh, tumors all throughout his body, all up and down his spine. They said there's nothing they could do. The chemotherapy wasn't doing it. They just gave him up to die. So I'm sharing with this minister. Isn't this a wonderful testimony? They went down there, laid hands on him, and he got up out of bed, and they kept doing CAT scans until finally there was nothing there. The guy was totally healed. Now, that was in the month of May that year. That August, he was running track in college, totally healed. And I'm just bragging about God, talking about the goodness of God, how great God is, how much God loves us. I never got a single hallelujah out of him. I never got a single praise the Lord. I never got even a smile out of him. He sat there, and he was so discouraged and so sad. And all of a sudden, I realized, wow, oh, you idiot. That preacher lost his son in his battle for cancer. That whole church prayed for that boy. He's the pastor. He prayed for his son, and that boy died. And now I'm talking about how, how much God healed this fellow and how much God loves us, and he didn't feel it. He's a pastor, but he's still a man, still a human being. And some of you have seen other people get what you've always wanted. And you've prayed and prayed for years and somebody else is hardly a Christian. Maybe not a Christian at all. And they pray one time and they get it just like that. They say, guess what? I prayed for such and such and God gave it to me yesterday. And you say, praise the Lord. Because you've been wanting that for six years or longer. And you don't have it. Yep, you get what I'm saying? You say, why is that? First of all, be assured of God's love before you try to answer that. Because here's what we do. I guess God doesn't love me anymore. I guess maybe he's mad at me. God's not hearing my prayer. It doesn't go any higher than the ceiling. I guess, I guess, I guess. And you guess wrong. There were times when you went to your earthly father and you asked for a favor and he didn't give it to you. That didn't mean they didn't love you. You know what I wanted when I was six years old? A little car, they gave me a tricycle, and eventually a bicycle, but they wouldn't give me a little car. And years later, when I was in my 30s, I said, Daddy, why is it that you never bought me that little car? I always want a little car. I want that more than anything, a little car to drive. Why didn't you give me that? He said, Keith, you wanted one with a real motor in it. <laughs> I'd forgotten that. So we're not going to let you down on the road with a, with a car and a motor in it, six years old. So sometimes God may not answer the way you ask him to because that's really not your best. A lot of times we wonder, why didn't God work things out for me 10 years ago or last week? And maybe he had something better in mind. But remember this, Romans 8, 28. Everybody here knows that scripture, I think. I hope so. God works all these things out for our good if we love God according to his purpose. Not that he causes bad things to happen, but he'll take the bad things. He'll take the mistakes. He'll take the faults and the weaknesses, and even the sins, and he'll work it together for your good. David committed a sin, and that's why Solomon, not Solomon, but uh, that's why the first child came and was born and died, and then he got married to Bathsheba as a result of having committed a sin. Now he was free to marry her because he killed her husband in that nice. They had to have to worry about divorce and remarriage issues, right? A lot of churches have a doctrine against divorce and remarriage. He just killed the husband. I took care of that. She's now a widow. He can marry her. What a dastardly thing. But now because he married this woman whom he stole from somebody else, he now had a son named Solomon. And the entire Jewish line of David came from Bathsheba. Go figure. Even David's horrible sin, God made it work together for good. And an entire Jewish dynasty resulted from David and Bathsheba. Go figure that one out. There's a lot of stuff we don't understand. But God can take these things and work them together for our good. Verse 25. No, wait a minute. I missed something here. Go that back to um, verse 17. All the nations, I'm in chapter 40. All the nations are before him as, uh, as nothing. To, verse 18. To whom will you liken God? What likeness will you compare him to? The workman melts a graven image, and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold and casts silver chains. He's making an idol. Verse 20. It mentions the last line, a graven image. Verse 21, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood? Verse 22, it is he 
who sits upon the circle of the earth. The Moffat version says the round the earth because the Hebrew word circle means an orb or a sphere. And the inhabitants thereof, all the seven, what is it, 7.3 billion people who are alive today, all the inhabitants are grasshoppers, as grasshoppers. That stretch, God who stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. At the outermost parts of the universe, scientists tell us it's speeding outward from the Big Bang. It's still exploding outward at 100,000 miles, I think, per second. It's going very, very fast. Verse 26, or let's go back to verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, God says, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who's created these things? Have you ever gone out at night and looked up at the stars and just said, wow, look at that. Who brings out their host by number. Wow. That he calls them all by names. By the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one fails. Now there's a hundred billion stars. There aren't that many names in the English language. There's not, I don't think there's even a million words in the English language. And yet God has names for all the stars. And that's just our galaxy. He says all of them by name. If God knows the names of the stars, let me ask you, does he know your name, your middle name? I bet you he knows your social security number too. He knows your telephone number. God knows everything about you. He knows about that little pain you've got back here. He knows about this little problem you've got here, this little problem you've got there. And it's not that God doesn't want to heal it. He's trying to get you to trust him and to realize how great he is. You know, it's a lot easier to have faith, and I've done a lot of messages on faith. It's a whole lot easier to have faith in God when you realize how great he is and the fact that he loves you. This is what we've got to be convinced of today, the greatness of God and the fact that this creator loves us. Verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, comma, and then here's the word in Hebrew that's, that's translated as the eternal, not the Lord, but the eternal. You see it in capital letters. The everlasting God, the eternal, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. You can't search his understanding. God has enough understanding. He can make a subatomic particle. You can't make a BB. Not by yourself without some machine to do it. How do you understand his understanding? He gives power to the faint. That may be you. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the eternal shall renew their strength. They will renew their strength if you'll wait upon God. He will give you the strength to get through whatever it is you're going through. Look at, we're still in the first chapter here, and I've got the whole book of Isaiah to cover today. Chapter 41 and verse 4. Who has wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the eternal, the first, and with the last, I am he. Now, Revelation 1.11 says Jesus is the first and the last. This is Jesus. Verse 21. Produce your call, says the eternal. Bring forth your strong reason, says the king of Jacob. A real king, see the capital K. Let them bring forth and Show us what will happen. All these other gods that you're worshiping, these heathen gods, let Baal, let Allah tell us what's going to happen in the future. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. Declare us things for to come. The Koran cannot predict the future, but the Bible does. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. This is God taunting the heathen. Yea, do good or do evil, do something. Verse 24, the Almighty says, Behold, you are of nothing. That's what God says about Allah. Now, there's an article coming along in the next issue of the Bible Truth, written by uh, a new uh, contributing editor, Mr. Stephen Harrison from Canada. He's written an excellent article on is Allah, the God of the uh, Muslims, is that the same as the God of the Bible? And I want you to read that article. It's a long article, but it's well worth reading. Very good article. And the true God says about all these other gods, Baal, Moloch, Allah, and Easter, and all these others, you are of nothing, and your work of naught, an abomination is he that chooses you. So God is taunting these other, these heathen, and their gods. 
Verse 26, who has declared from the beginning that, you, that we may know? These other gods can't do that. And before time that we may say he's righteous. There's none that shows, yea, there's none that declares, yea, there's none that hears your words. Any questions so far? Chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delights. I put my spirit, the margin says Holy Spirit, upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Let me ask you, who is God talking about there? Who is God's servant here? Who's bringing forth judgment to the Gentiles? Jesus. Jesus. This is talking about Jesus. Verse 2. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break. The smoking flax shall he not quench. That's a quote. Well, that's not a quotation from the New Testament. This is quoted in the New Testament. This is actually found in the New Testament referring to Jesus. Verse 4. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he set judgment in the earth. And that's at the second coming. And the isles shall wait for his law. Oh, I thought Christ abolished the law when he came. No. When he returns to this earth, they're all going to be waiting for him to provide the law of God. What, what the Jews call the law of Moses. It has not been done away. Verse 5. Thus says God, the eternal. He that created the heavens. Two trillion galaxies we now know. And stretched them out. He that sp spread forth the earth. And that which comes out of it. He that gives breath to the people. God gives you every breath of air you breathe. Verse 6, I, the eternal, have called you and will hold your hand and keep you and give you for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison. That's quoted in Luke chapter 4, if I remember correctly. Talking about Jesus. Verse 9, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. God predicted what would happen in the last days when it's coming to pass. God predicted the Roman Empire before it ever started in the book of Daniel. God predicted it would be destroyed and it would be revived seven times. It has so far been revived six times. How did God know that? When you, those of you who have gone through the bachelor's class and you studied church history, Revelation 2 and 3, it is absolutely amazing how specifically accurate in detail those letters were to the seven churches and how they, they came to pass over the last 2,000 years. Each of those churches pictures church eras, and if you understand them correctly, they were very, God was very, very specific about what would happen, and it came to pass exactly as God said. Verse 21, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. Who? Verse 1, my servant. Who is God's servant here? As you said, it's Jesus. He, Jesus, will magnify the law and make it honorable. He didn't abolish the law. He magnified it. And he's the same today as he was yesterday. Verse 24. Who gave Jacob for a spoil? Meaning to be despoiled by others. And Israel to the robbers? Did not the eternal? He against whom we have sinned? And America has sinned against God. For they would not walk in his ways. Neither were they obedient to his law. Are churches today obedient to God's law? Or do they say, oh, we don't have to keep the law anymore. That was abolished at Calvary. But in the last days, when Jesus returns, he's going to magnify the law to all nations. He even did it in the first coming. And it says we need to be obedient to his law. How plain do we want it? Chapter 43. Are there any questions on that chapter? Chapter 43 and verse 1. But now thus says the eternal that created you, old Jacob. Verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Have you heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? For I am the eternal, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for you. Since, verse 4, you were precious. Now I'm reading from the King James, but it says, Thou wast precious. Let's put that bar in us. Since you were precious in my sight, you've been honorable. And I've loved you. At about this time, if you're like me and you're a Gentile, because I'm German, I'm as Gentile as they come. I'm full-blooded German, too. I, I used to read that and think, man, I wish I was an Israelite, because then God would be talking to me. Well, Galatians 3, 28, 29 says, if you're a Christian, God has put you in the family of Abraham. You are now an Israelite, no matter what your ethnicity is. I'm German, but now I'm an Israelite. 
So God says to those, and he loves the adopted as much as, as much as he loves the biological children. He says, I have loved you. God loves us who are Christians. We're a part of Israel now. Therefore, I'll give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring your seed from the east and gather them from the west and so on. So God says in verses 5 and 6 that all of the, the tribes of Israel will be regathered. That did not happen in 1948. It's still waiting to come to pass. Verse 10. You're my witnesses, says the eternal, and my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the eternal, and beside me there's no Savior. And who's talking here? Jesus. The only God that they knew was the second member of the God. They didn't know about the Father yet. In the book of John, Jesus said he came to reveal the Father. Verse 22, you have not called upon me, O Jacob. Verse 23 talks about all the sacrifices and everything that they've offered. They're religious, but they're not living right. Verse 25, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. When you repent, God forgives and he puts it aside. He doesn't bring it up. Let me tell you what you did 10 years ago. You've already repented of it. You've asked God to forgive you. He doesn't bring it to you. I will not remember your sins. Verse 26, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Put me in remembrance. Remind me of what I've said, God says. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Put God in remembrance of his promises. Chapter 44 and verse 6. Thus says the eternal, the king of Israel, and his redeemer, the eternal host, I am the first, I am the last. Beside me, there's no God. Who says that in the New Testament? Jesus does. Verse 8, the last part, is there a God beside me? Yea, there's no God, I know not any. So Allah is, is not a God. The Bible says Satan is the God of this world, but he's not a true God. He's a spirit being. But he's not a true God. Verses 13 through 19, I won't read all that, but it talks about all the idols. How they take a tree and they cast it in the fire to warm themselves. They take part of the tree and they cook on it. And then what's left, they make a god out of it. They make a god out of the residue. What they don't use for food or to, or to, or to warm their house, they make a god out of it. How stupid is that? Verse 19, the last line, shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? A stock, the trunk, the, the trunk, the stump. They're falling down and worshiping the dumb thing. Maybe putting a, carving a face on it and bowing down and worshiping a stump. Boy, where in the world did they get that from? But the true God can do things that a stump can't do and a stone can't do. <coughs> Verse 24, the fifth, fourth line down, third line, certain third line. I am the eternal that makes all things that stretches forth the heavens alone that spreads abroad the earth by myself. That frustrates the tokens. Verse 25. Verse 26 that confirms the word of the servant. Verse 27 that says to the deep, be dry. Look at verse 28 that says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd. Cyrus? He wasn't Jewish. He wasn't an Israelite either. He was the king of Persia. Modern day Iran. He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now, if you look at the date at the top of the page in your reference Bible, it says this was written about 712 B.C. Is Judah, Israel had already gone into captivity. The Jews were still in the land. And God is talking about something that's going to happen well over 200 years later. And names this guy by his name 200 years years before he was born how great is this god he's not just a, a picture on the stained glass window which violates the second commandment by the way people take his name in vain because they don't realize the greatness the power of god if you could see jesus in his natural form if you could actually see him if he showed up right here in the street and all of a sudden there's jesus in his natural glorified body it would be like a hydrogen bomb explosion going off the power that radiates from his body, it would just blind you. The Bible says you can't look on God and live. 
The next time they drop a hydrogen bomb somewhere, just stand there and stare at it for a little bit. You won't last long. The power that radiates from that bomb will kill you. And God is more powerful than the atom. God says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd. Verse 1 of chapter 45, thus says the eternal to his anointed, to Cyrus, <coughs> whose right hand I've held, to subdue nations, and he did. And I will loose the loins of kings, and that happens, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the, uh, and the gates shall not be shut. That was Babylon. If you read how Cyrus came in and conquered Babylon, God said this is going to happen 200 years before the guy was born. How great is this God we serve? Verse three. Look at the last. Look at the last three lines. That you may know that I, the Eternal, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. Verse four. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have called, even called you by your name. I have surnamed you, though you have not known me. God laid it on his mama's heart to name him Cyrus, and he became the king of Persia, two hundred years before his parents were even born. How did God do that? I don't know. How, how did he know this was going to happen? I don't know. There was another guy named Josiah. He was named 300 years before he was born. Do you understand who this God is we're talking to? When you've got a problem and you come before God, it's not that God's not powerful enough to solve your problem. But sometimes he wants us to, to believe he will. Not just that he can. I hear people say, I know God can do it. God will if you do what you're supposed to do. Jesus didn't say, ask and you might receive. He didn't say, ask, this is Matthew 7, 7. He didn't say, ask and God could do it for you. He said, ask and you will receive. Verse 8, the first part says, for everyone that asks, receives. Now, i got to give you a caveat, a warning, a caution. Be careful what you ask for. Make sure it's what you want. Because all of a sudden it shows up. And you say, wait a minute. Do I really want this? Before you pray, look, if I put in an order through Sears or some company like that, I, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be uh, giving them my credit card number or writing them a check or doing something. I've got to make sure I really want that before I place my order. Is that not right? Because when it shows up, I pay for it. When you come to God and say, God, this is what I'm asking you for, get ready. And the Bible tells us to ask in faith, and then we'll receive. All right, I got to hurry along here. I'm trying to impress upon you the greatness of God because it's hard to have faith in a God that you don't really realize just how great this God is whom we serve. Let's see, we're in chapter what, 45? We're in chapter 45, okay. Um, Verses 17 through 18, Israel shall be saved and eternal with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or confounded. World without end. God said, it's going to work out great. You're in a bad situation now, but one day you're going to be blessed. Verse 18, thus says the eternal that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain for no use. He's got a reason for it. He formed it to be inhabited. I, the eternal, I am the eternal, and there is none else. Verse 19, the last line, I declare things that are right. Verse 21, the last three lines, there is no God else beside me. I just God and a Savior, there's none beside me. Look to me, verse 22, and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is none else. And verse 23, the last two lines, unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. You know who that is? That's Jesus, because in Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, every knee will bow to Christ. Chapter uh, 46, verse 4. Even in your old age, I am he. And even the, the hoar hairs, H-O-A-R, like hoar frost, it means the white hairs. Even when you reach that stage and you've got a gray hair, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. Even when you get old and weak, God says, I'm not going to forsake you. And whom you will whom and whom will you liken me? Who are you going to compare God to? And make me equal and compare me that we may be like? You can't compare God to anybody. God is awesome. Verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I'm God. There's none else. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the 
beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Verse 11, the last three lines, I have spoken it, I also will bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I also will do it. You read the book of Revelation and you find out what's going to happen in the last days. And it's going to happen exactly as the Bible says. And if you don't believe that, hang around long enough to see it happen. Back in the 1800s, people who, they began to really study prophecy in the 1800s. And uh, there was a man called William Miller who, who started what is called the Advent Movement. He began to study the Daniel. He was coming up with when the end would be. And at that time, when they read Revelation 13, they said, taking a mark in your right hand, that's not possible for everybody to have a mark. That's impossible. That's got to be something symbolic. Well, why would it be symbolic? It says you can't buy or sell without it. What do we buy and sell with? Money. Do you know they've got a mark on every single product you buy? It's called the UPC symbol. If you look at it, the first line, if you know how to read those UPC lines, the first line is a six. Look at the middle line, that's a six. And the last line is a six. Six, six, six. Every UPC code is embedded with six, six, six. And you don't, they, they don't buy and sell without it. Now that doesn't mean you've got the mark of the beast or the number because the beast hasn't yet arisen. But what I'm telling you is the technology is here. The computer technology is here. And now they're talking about people voluntarily uh, laying their hand on a scanner when they go to the doctor or they go to the hospital. Have you seen those scanners? If even, uh, in other words, they can scan your hand to identify you. And one of these days, it may not happen in the next 10 years, and then again it might. One of these days you'll go to the grocery store and they'll say, put your hand on the scanner, we'll debit your bank account. Oh, you don't have a number in your hand? Well, we don't accept cash. Put all those groceries back. And unless you're a Philadelphian Christian, when that day comes, you're not going to be able to buy and sell. How did John know that 2,000, almost 2,000 years ago? Because God told him to write it down. God knew that the technology would exist where they could put a microchip in your hand and everybody will one day be asked to take one and one day everybody will be forced to take one. That may not happen in your lifetime, but what if it does? Are you a Philadelphian? Are you a true Philadelphian Christian? Because Revelation 3.10 says if you're a Philadelphian, he will protect you from this. He will feed you, though you can't buy groceries. He may have to rain down manna from heaven, but God's going to protect you. But if you're just a typical Christian, lukewarm today, or spiritually dead like Sardis, and you can take it or leave it, you pray for the ministry or you don't, you support it or you don't, or you come to church or you don't. I mean, if it's not important to you, if you never read your Bible and you're just kind of a lukewarm Christian, read what Jesus said to the Laodicean church. There's no promise of protection. There is a promise that he'll spew you out of his mouth like lukewarm water, but there's no promise of protection from the tribulation. But Revelation Chapter 3, starting in verse 8, says, Because you've kept my word, you've not denied my name. Verse 10, I will keep you out of that mess. I'll keep you from it. The Greek word ek means out of it. I'll keep you out of the tribulation. You won't have to be a part of it. Because now they have the technology to put a chip in the hand of every child. The day he's born, they can put the chip in there. And what happens when the state mandates it? You say, what's wrong with the chip? Nothing intrinsically, inherently, but what if you have to sign allegiance to the beast system to get it? What if you have to deny Christianity to get it? Will you do that? What if you have to swear allegiance to the beast system? What's wrong with the chip? But God said everybody's going to take that or the number. Why does it mention the forehead? Everybody, everybody has a forehead. You may not have a hand that you can open, like my grandmother had so much arthritis she couldn't open her hand. She had a forehead. So if you can't, huh? Could be amputated. The person may his his arm may be amputated, but everybody's got a forehead. So you'll take it in the hand or the forehead. Unless you're a Philadelphian. Or you can just be martyred and say, Well, I'm not a Philadelphian. The latest sins are going to repent. They're going to get martyred. Man, I've got so much more to cover. Let's go on here. We're in chapter 46. Is that where we are? Let's go to chapter 47, verse 13. 
You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers and the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, let them stand up and save you. Verse 14, what's going to happen to the astrologers and the horoscope writers and maybe those who read their daily horoscopes for guidance? Behold, they shall be a stubble, the fire shall burn them. Don't look to them for guidance. Look to God for guidance. Chapter 48, verse 3. I have declared the former things from the beginning. Over and over, we read the greatness of God in this chapter, in, in this whole section here. Chapter uh, ch chapter 48, verse 5, I have even from the beginning declared it to you. Before it comes to pass, I showed it to you. Verse 12, the last part, I am he, I am the first and the last. Again and again, we read about the greatness of God in this, in this part 2 of Isaiah. In chapter uh, 49, Verse 12, Behold, these shall come far and low from the north and from the west and from the land of Sinai, which are the reference Bible tells you we think that's China. So all these tribes are going to come back to the promised land, not in 1948, but all the tribes will come back after Jesus comes back to this earth. And God said he's not going to forget us. Verses 14, 15, and 16, God said he will not forget us. Chapter 50 and verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So far as I know, 100% of all commentaries will tell you that's talking about Jesus. The God of creation who made all things, who is the first and the last, became a man and went through this horrible punishment so we don't have to. Verse 9. The Lord eternal will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. <clears throat> the whole universe eventually is going to vanish away. Chapter 51, verse 1. Hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn. Who is the rock of Israel? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4 says it's Christ. Psalm 18, verse 1 says the rock of Israel is God Almighty. Verse 4, it says, O nation, a law shall proceed from me. That's Jesus when he returns. He's going to teach the whole world his law. Verse uh, 6, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away. That's Revelation 21. Like smoke, the earth shall wax old, meaning it will become old, like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever. My righteousness shall not be abolished. What's the definition of righteousness? Psalm 119 verse 172 says all of God's commandments are righteousness and that righteousness will not be abolished. So it did not get abolished at the cross. Verse 7, hearken to me, you that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Because that's what righteousness is. Isn't that amazing? People think that Jesus came to destroy the law. He said, don't think I've come to destroy the law. But they think it anyway. Something in verse 16 that I've always found interesting. What are we going to be doing for all eternity? I have put my words in your mouth and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth one day. God said, I put my words in your mouth so that I could make it. Now, Ephesians 3, 9 says, God created all things by Jesus Christ. Is God going to create the new heavens, which we know he will, but we, will he do it through you? I'm putting my words in your mouth so that I can create the heavens, so that I can plant this new heavens. We already got one heavens, but there's coming a new heavens. Is it possible that you and I as children of God for all eternity will be working with the Father like Jesus worked with the Father to create the new heavens? Something to think about. It may start here at the earth, our sun, our moon, maybe things will change here when uh, God the Father comes. But what about all those other galaxies? Eventually, they're all going to go out, won't they? Just like they use up their energy. And so you and I may be used of God the Father to make more worlds and more stars. You say, that's crazy, Keith. It's crazy to you as a human being, but you don't understand something. You're not going to be human forever. Chapter uh, 52, verse 7. 
How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that brings good tidings, good news. And that's quoted in the New Testament referring to the gospel. Verses 13 through 15, it talks about how that this great God became a man and his visage was so marked, verse 14, more than any man is formed, more than the sons of man. Talking about the margin says at the bottom of the page, the effects of the crucifixion. Chapter 53 is all about the first coming of Jesus and that God laid all the sin of mankind on his servant, who is Jesus Christ, and he took our sins for us. Chapter 54 and verse 5. Your maker is your husband. God uses the old covenant like a marriage covenant. And the new covenant is like a marriage covenant. He says your maker, the one who created you, is like a husband to you. Jesus is the husband. He's also the creator. Verse 7. For a small moment have I forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather you. And a little wrath, verse 8. I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I'll have mercy on you says the Lord your Redeemer. Have you ever felt forsaken? Don't answer out loud. Have you ever felt like God wasn't listening? That God has forsaken you? Where's God? I'm in this big mess. Where is God? For a little moment it seems like he's forsaken you. But he won't. And he's going to rescue you. He's going to come for you. Are there any questions at this point? Chapter 54 verse but five, I read that. He's your maker. Let's go to chapter 55, verse 3, the last part. He's going to make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Verse 11, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void. Everything that God says is going to come to pass. Chapter 56, verse 1. Thus says the eternal, keep you judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, my righteousness to be revealed. For the whole world, that's at the second coming of Christ when he saves the world. Blessed is the man that does this, any man at the second coming, if you still obey God. And the son of man that lays hold on it, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, keeps his hand from doing any evil, all the world will be obeying the Ten Commandments. Neither let the son of the stranger, that's the Gentile, who's joined himself to the Lord, say, don't let him say the Lord has separate, separated me from his people. Oh, I'm a Gentile. I, God has separated me. No, no. God has not separated us. Through Christ, God has adopted us as, as the family of Israel. For, and don't let the eunuch say, I'm a dry tree. Verse 4, thus says the Lord to the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose those things that please me. This is at the second coming of Jesus. Even unto them I'll give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. Verse 6, also, the sons of the stranger, that's most of us in this room, we're Gentiles, that join themselves to the eternal to serve him and to love the name of the eternal, to be his servants, everyone, not just Jews, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Germans like me, Africans, Eskimos, Chinese, Japanese, whatever you happen to be. Everybody will have a chance to serve God if they will obey his commandments. Chapter 57, verse 15. Thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. God not only inhabits the future, he inhabits the past, which our minds don't understand. Whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is contrite and humble. If you're contrite and humble, you'll dwell with God for eternity. Chapter 58, verse 1. Spare not. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show them their sins. Now, this is what he said to Isaiah. Verses 7 through 11 says, If you'll help the poor and you'll feed the poor and you'll help the afflicted and you'll cover the naked, if you will be good and help the poor and stop gossiping, verse 9. If you draw out your soul, verse 10, to the hungry, verse 11, then, the Lord will guide you continually. Everybody in this room needs divine guidance. Verse 12, and then you'll build the old waste places. Verse 13, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure on that day, nor speaking your own words, then you'll delight yourself in the Lord. I'll cause you to write upon the high places of the earth. I think about that when I get in a little airplane. I'm flying, you know, three to 5,000 feet over the earth. I'm looking down at the trees. I'm flying over the high places of the earth. 
I'm in the high places. I'm going to put my clouds on. Think about that. Chapter 59. God's hand, verse 1, is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But our iniquities have separated us so that God doesn't hear our prayers. Sometimes we've just got iniquity. Verse 7, their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Americans are making haste this day, on this weekend, mostly on Saturdays, to go to the abortion clinics and kill not hundreds, but thousands of little babies. And that is cold-blooded murder. And God says that they make haste to shed innocent blood. And therefore, verse 8, they don't know the way of peace. They don't know the way of peace. You think that God is going to allow women to kill their little babies that they don't want when Jesus returns? You think that's going to happen? I tell you no. Chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, your light has come. You and I are going to literally arise from the dead. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. That day is coming. Verse 12, the nation and kingdom that shall not serve you shall perish. And there he's talking to Israel. Verse 13, look at the last line. I will make the place of my feet glorious. That's not heaven. That's here on this earth. The last part of verse 16. I, the Lord, and your Savior and Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. He's the one that's coming back to this earth. Verse 18, violence shall no more be heard in your land. And just yesterday, I was watching the news. And I was watching how uh, about how bad it was now in Israel and how there's so much terrorism and violence in the land. God said, that's going to come to an end. No more violence, wasting or destruction within your borders. You'll be called, your walls will be called salvation. Your gates will be called praise. So God is going to change all that. Chapter 61, verse 1, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings. That refers to Jesus. I think it's Luke 4. Verse 6, you'll be called priest of the Lord. We're going to teach people God's way. Verse 11, the last part, the last three lines, the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. That's in the millennium. That's certainly not happening today. Chapter 62 and verse 2, the Gentiles will see your righteousness. You'll be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And that's in Revelation. We're going to get a new name. That'll be a lot easier for people to pronounce because people have a hard time pronouncing my last name. Verse 6, I've set watchmen upon your walls, O Jerusalem. You that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. We should tell people about Christ. Are you doing that? Verse 9, they that have brought, uh, well, I won't read all that, but it says well, you're going to be gathering uh, grapes from your vineyard and making wine with it. Verse 9 says, they that they have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. That's pretty interesting. Verse 11, the last three lines, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Revelation 22, 12 says that's talking about Jesus. Chapter 63, verse 4, the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed is come. We're the redeemed. That day of vengeance refers to the second coming of Jesus. And verse 5, I looked and there was none to help and I wondered there was none available. Therefore my own arm brought salvation to me and my uh, fury, it upheld me. Jesus' own arm helped him because he was not under grace. Galatians 4, verse 4 says he was under the law. He was not under grace. He had to earn his salvation and he earned it for you too. Because God imputes that to us. Verse 16. Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us. Abraham doesn't know about us, but God's our father. And Israel acknowledges not. They don't see us as Israelites, but God does. You, O eternal, are our father, our redeemer. That's Jesus. Your name is from everlasting. Chapter 64. Verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Look at verse 2, the last part. The nations may tremble at thy presence. Verse 3, the last line. At thy presence. He's really, literally coming back. And you've heard me tell 
uh, before in class how the Jehovah's Witnesses say, oh, he's staying in heaven forever. He's never coming, never coming back to the earth. This says he's coming back. He will literally be present on this earth. This great God whom we serve. Verse 8, but now, O eternal, you are our father, we're the clay. You're the potter, we're the work of your hand. God made you, and therefore he loves you. No matter what you're going through, he loves you, and he wants to bless you. Verse 11, our holy and beautiful home where our fathers praised you is burned up with fire, and all of our pleasant things are laid waste. That was written around 700 B.C., but it came to pass in 586 B.C. God was writing. God calls things that be not as though they were, the Bible says. He's predicting what's going to happen by writing as if it's already happened. Chapter 65 and verse 3. Here's a people that provokes me to anger continually. They sacrifice in gardens, which was against God's law, to burn incense upon altars of brick. God said, don't do that. Who remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, who eat swine's flesh. When Christ returns, he's going to put a stop to that. And the broth of abominable things in their vessels. These are religious people. Verse 5, who say, stand by yourself. You go over and stand in the corner. Don't come near me because I'm holier than thou. You ever heard that? People who are holier than thou? That's where it comes from right there, the book of Isaiah. Don't touch me. I'm, I'm super righteous. I'm holier than thou. In other words, if she were a real Christian, she wouldn't be wearing jewelry. If he was a real Christian, he wouldn't be wearing whatever, a toupee. Some people think it's sin for a man to wear a toupee. And it's wrong to wear jewelry. And it's wrong to wear earrings. The Bible doesn't condemn that. Now, if you don't believe in wearing it, don't wear it. But don't, don't say, I'm holier than you because I don't wear jewelry. And there are some women who, who, in certain churches who look at other women who wear makeup and say, well, look at those women wearing makeup, wearing that jewelry. I'm holier than they are. Be careful about that. Because you know what? God loves those people who wear makeup too. Now, I don't wear makeup myself. You don't either. No, he said that's not what we heard. And I started, awesome. <laughs> and I started to say That's not what you heard. Huh? I do not wear makeup, but I don't criticize anybody who does. Some people, makeup makes them look nice. <laughs> I don't criticize anybody for wearing makeup. So I'm not going to wear it. I'm holier than you because I don't wear it. See, that's our self-righteous attitude. We don't want to do that. Verse 7, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers. You burned incense upon the mountains. You blaspheme me upon the hills. Don't do that. And verse 9, I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah and inherit of my mountains. My elect, and the New Testament says that's the Christians, shall inherit it and my servants shall dwell there. How about that? Man, it's amazing. Look at verse uh, 17. I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. A hundred thousand years from now, you probably won't say, you know, I used to live here in, in Concord or Charlotte or wherever. I used to live here, I used to live there. You won't even be thinking about that anymore. It's going to be a whole new existence for all of us here in this room today and those watching by the internet. It's going to be a whole new existence for the whole planet Earth. It's pretty amazing. It's something that's hard for us to understand. Verse 19, I'll rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. Verse 20, during the millennium, the life expectancy will be 100 years, not 70, not 3 score and 10, but 100 Chapter 66 and verse 2. All these things have my hand made, and all those things have been, says the Lord. But to this man will I look, to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Not poor in pocketbook, poor in spirit. If you have a poor and contrite spirit and you tremble at God's word, God says, I'm looking to the person who will respect my word. And there are a lot of church goers that have never read this Bible from cover to cover. Never read it. I'm talking about people who go to church every week. And they don't know what this book says because they haven't read it. One lady many years ago told a preacher, she said, we pay our pastor to read it for us and he interprets it for us. We don't have to read it. 
That's what we pay him to do. Well, how do you know he's telling you the truth? Well, he went to seminary. Which one? Where did he go to seminary? Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, verse 3, if you kill an ox, you're just like a, somebody who slew a man. If you sacrifice a lamb, you just like you cut off the dog's neck. God's not interested in the physical rituals of religion. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, their own doctrines, their own teachings. Their soul delights in their abominations. But they go, oh, but they're religious. They're very religious. Verse 5, hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, they said, let the Lord be glorified, but he will appear in your joy and they'll be ashamed. Some of them may have thrown you out because you start obeying God. There was a fellow who was a drunk. He came to church every week, drunk as a skunk, and they said, poor fellow. And one day he got into the book of Romans and he said, guess what? I just found out that God has imputed the righteousness of Christ to me. And, and what is it? Romans 3.23 says, I am the righteousness of God. And they threw him out of church. They couldn't understand that. They threw the man out of the church. Verse 14. When you see this, your heart will rejoice, your bones shall flourish like a herb, like an herb, and the hand of the Lord shall be numb toward his servants, and indignation toward his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire. Who is this? This is Jesus Christ. And with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. When you see Jesus, it's going to look like a fireball. The, 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 just the flames and the, the energy radiating from his body. For by fire and by sword he will plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. When Christ returns, he's killing a bunch of people. If you, Zechariah 14, talks about those who rebel against Christ at his second coming. If you rebel against him, boy, you're in trouble. Because he's going to put people to death. And Luke 19, it says, bring those people who would not did not want me to rule over them, bring them here and slay them before me. That's Luke 19. Jesus said, I'm going to kill them. He's not coming back as the humble carpenter, meek and mild. There's an old Baptist hymn, Jesus, meek and mild. That might have been the first time, but when he comes back, there's nothing mild about him. He's coming back with a sword, and he's going to kill the people who reject him and re refuse his government. For by fire and by sword, he'll plead with all flesh. Verse 17. Those in, in that day when Christ returns, who sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one in the midst eating swine's flesh. I don't know why they added the word tree there, not italics. Trees don't mean anything. Behind one person in the midst eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse. You know, people in China eat mice. Shall be consumed together, says the Lord. Be careful what you're eating when the Lord returns. And Find out what God wants you to eat now. For I know their works and their thoughts will come. I will gather all nations and tongues, and they will see my glory. Revelation says, every eye will see him. I will set a sign among them that escape of the nations, Tarshish and all these other places. These places that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory. And they'll declare my glory among the Gentiles. I heard a preacher on the radio say, when Jesus comes back, probation is ended. Nobody can get saved after Christ returns. This says, that all these nations like Tarshish and Pool and Tubal who have not heard of his name, they will missionaries will be sent out in the millennium to declare his name, give them a chance to be saved. Probation is an end. That's when the majority of the world is going to be saved in that day. And they'll bring all of your brethren. And verse 23. Well, let's look at verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it will come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one month to another, and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. Now that's during the millennium. How great is our God? Well, when you go through a trial and you go through heartache and you go through a time when it seems like God is not answering your prayer, first of all, God is so great, there's nobody else but him. He considers himself to be your father. And Jesus said, here's how you pray. You pray our father. Every person in this room, those watching by the internet, every one of us have gone through struggles and trials, heartaches, disappointments, disillusionments, frustrations. We've been depressed. If nothing else, you've had a pain that the doctor couldn't fix. And that was depressing. There are problems, but God hasn't forsaken us. He is great. He's awesome. 
He's our healer. He's our redeemer. But you've got to realize something very important. God does love you no matter what you've done. No matter who you are. I'm a Gentile. He loves me too. He loves us no matter what. He loves you as a father. And if you've done some bad things, say, God, I'm sorry. I'm crazy. I'm stupid. I did some stupid stuff. Forgive me. And he will. But can he make it better? Can God straighten out the mess and make it better? Can God not necessarily turn back the clock, but can he start anew from today and, and, and start making your life right? Is it ever too late for God? Listen, God can do a lot of stuff. One final thing. Some of you, maybe like me, you've lost parents or loved ones. And you said, man, I wish I could go back and ask their forgiveness. I wish I could apologize. I wish I could tell them I love them. I wish, I wish, I wish. Folks, don't waste your time on that. They're coming back. John 5, 28, 29, all of them are coming back. One day you can tell your mom how much you loved her. You can tell your grandma how much you loved her. One day you can make amends with all the people that you've ever wanted to. Folks, they're not gone. They're just away. Every single person that you've ever lost, you're going to have a chance to spend eternity with. Because God loves you. And he's going to make it right. God is going to make all this mess. He's going to make it right one day. Any questions from the internet? Do you have any? Any comments? We're about this about a two seconds delay, so I just said we still do it on Facebook. Uh, congratulations. Uh, that was a twenty six book and uh, <laughs> it's still pretty impressive. Yeah. Pretty twenty six books. Chapters. Oh, twenty six chapters? chapters? Yeah. I just read through twenty six chapters in an hour. Dr. Roller, it takes him about a whole hour to go through two verses. <laughs> But you know, those chapters, let me say this, I'm going to dismiss you. 40 through 66, if you've never just sat down and read it verse by verse, morning, you want some encouragement? I just finished that a couple of weeks ago. I guess it was last week. I was just finishing Isaiah. I'm in the book of Jeremiah now. Read those chapters and encourage yourself more. Any, any questions or comments? We do. All right. Thank you all for coming. Good to see everybody. Good to have Mr. Gra uh, Gravy. Gravy. Graver. Graver. I'm sorry. Good to have all of you again. We'll see you all next week. All of you come back next week. We'll see you then. You're dismissed.